Neu Recife, Porto de Galinhas. It's my first time in Brazil. Um, although this talk is actually, it's the second time I'm doing this in a Lusophone country. Um, so I had to make a few changes, of course. Nothing too dramatic. This is front-end choices with a soft reload. Except it's not really about choice. Um, I'm still not happy with the talk, even though I've given it, uh, sorry, with the title of the talk, even though I've given it four times already. Um, it's not so much a talk about whether choice is a good thing, rather it's a forage, it's a rampage, it's a uh, wander through the world of front-end development uh, uh, and how that relates to Rails. And the really pertinent question that I hope we get to today, and if we don't get to it during my talk, perhaps we'll get to it in the questions afterwards, is, and phrased beautifully by, um, by uh, uh, this gentleman here, how can Rails react to the rise of JavaScript applications? A few words about me. I'm a back-end guy living in a front-end world. I don't know if anyone else identifies with that. My foray into front-end development has been accidental. Um, but that's what I'm paid for. I live in Berlin. I've hacked in the past on projects like Datamapper, Refinery JS, uh, Refinery CMS. Um, I am grateful to my employer for allowing me to come here and making my trip possible. I am paid to work full time on open source, and I work on a project called Open Project, uh, which is a Rails-based project management system, project management software forked from Redmine. And in fact, my experiences re-architecting the UI influenced what I'll talk about today. Uh, if you want to check out this out, by the way, it's open source. You can download packages for Debian, for Yum, etc and we're going to launch a software as a service uh, later this year. In my free time, the little that I have in the past, I've organized conferences in Europe. Um, I founded two conferences in Europe, uh, EuroCamp and JRubyConf EU. And uh, they're happening again this year, but fortunately without me, I get a break. Uh, but I'd recommend you check them out. I'm also helping this year with the European uh, Ruby conference in Salzburg in, in October. So if you have any questions about the European scene, European conferences, come and talk to me about that. I know a lot more about conference organizing than I do about Ruby. Oh. <laughs> um, anyway, that is enough advertising. Thank you uh, for letting me uh, make some shameless plugs. Let's cast our minds back 10 years ago. What was I doing? Well, I was at university still. I was doing activism, campaigning against things, campaigning against the injustices of the world, wars, etc. cetera. Um, what was the world doing? Well, Blair and Bush had just gone to war in Iraq and won. There was the US elections in November 2004. There was a tragic uh, tsunami. What was Brazil doing? Well, this was, the, this was the era of Lula. Everyone was full of optimism, I believe. Hopefully, that's, optimism is still there. I still feel it. Ask yourselves what you were doing. Um, I made a horrible joke about this in the past. I'm not going to make it. But uh, if, if we were at a JavaScript conference, uh, some people wouldn't even be, wouldn't even be in, would probably still be in kindergarten. What was Apple doing? Apple, in two, at the end of 2004, there was the iPhone, uh, sorry, the iPod, fourth generation, white, but the first color screens had just come out. We were in the era of Mac OS 10.3 Panther. We, were, we saw for the first time the brushed metal finder, horror of horrors, something that uh, they finally got rid of after all this time. 
And then what was the web doing at the end of 2004, 2005? Well, Microsoft had won the browser wars at the end of the 1990s. It was the heyday of IE6. The browser statistics for the 8th of October 2004 in the US, IE had 93% of the market share in the US. Now, maybe that varies a little bit about a little bit by country, but I think that pretty much represents the world as a whole. Uh, Firefox, Netscape was on 3%. Firefox was on almost 2.5%. Um, there, at the time, Firefox was still in beta. Uh, this was a time when everything was very, very much dominated by IE. And it was a time when there was no jQuery. What did we even do back then? Well, we had document get element by e ID. Uh, if you had to support IE 5.5, then document all. Um, it was a tough time. It was a tough time back then. But the end of 2004 marked a transition. In, at the end of 2004, CSS query, the precursor and the inspiration for jQuery was launched. And there were glimmers of hope, because despite the dominance of IE, there was a burgeoning standards movement. There were guys like Feldman and Listapart, the people behind Listapart, Eric A. Meyer, who were pushing for standards. Pixel Perfect was really hard back then. Tables were frowned upon by the standards movement. Um, but CSS, but they were able to, to push forward CSS, and there were a lot of hacks. There were a lot of, there were a lot of things you had to do to make things work, uh, but, um, but there was a lot of experimentation. The, the really big thing that happened, though, at the end of 2004 was browser competition. So out of the Netscape 7 market flop grew Firefox. And Firefox 1 was finally released in 2004. This New York Times ad was from December 2004. That was back in the day when New York Times was worth more than Instagram. It's also a recycled joke. Um, and fantastic 2004, November 24th, 2004, the first SVN commit of Rails. Rails, the reason why we're probably all here in this room right now. DHH was hard on a hard at work on, on this framework, extracting this out from, from the product they developed there at 37 signals. Still, despite all of this, we mostly had websites. We were in an era of websites rather than web applications. So let's look at Yahoo from back in 2004. Not particularly thrilling. Well, the content hasn't got any better in the last 10 years, but the design fortunately has. Um, where we did have applications, and there were people working on DHH, sorry, DHTML web applications. Um, examples of this were cutting edge work by a guy called Eric Ardvidsen, who's now working on Gmail and Polymer at Google. Uh, his product that back then was called uh, Bindos. But where we did have applications, um, what's really notable is that these developers would try to faithfully emulate the desktop UI, rather than try and build something new for the web. And so in this case, they, Windows is a very faithful, uh, faithful representation or clone of, um, of a Windows GUI. So it looks very Windows-like uh, if you're, and that was probably what the, that was what the, that's what the market desired. They wanted something that looked like, looked like a Windows desktop. Um, maybe an exception to that rule was the Gmail pre-beta at the end of 2004, which went its own way, had a web look and feel. But for the most part, um, for the most part, we were looking at something that was just trying to reproduce the desktop in the browser. So where are we now? How have things changed? Well, we now have this, we now have applications, and not DHTML applications, just applications, web applications. 
we use that term heavily. SoundCloud is a great example. I'm giving another plug to a Berlin-based company here. I don't work for them, but they do have a good product. Um, and part of this is the move to single-page application architecture. So as with applications, single-page application architecture is now a thing. I thought I'd take just one moment to reflect on what it actually means or could mean. There's no single definition for what a single page application architecture actually is. Um, it's not set in stone, but um, at its minimum, it's chunking. That is namely that fragments of data, that you send fragments of data rather than full pages across the wire. So those fragments of data may be JSON, they may be HTML, they may even be XML. And then on top of that, you have other layers. You might have controllers, you might have templating, routing. And if you're really getting really fancy, you could build something with real-time communication on top of that, think WebRTC, and you could build local persistence, have some sort of local storage mechanism that syncs. So that, that is single-page application architecture. I would say, though, you could probably just have the first one. That would suffice. You don't necessarily need to have complex uh, controllers or, or templating, but you do need to have chunking to have a minimal single-page application. So what's Rails doing in all of this? Well. Um, I'm going to try not to conflate the Rails way and Rails, um, but um, I would say Rails is so 2005. The Rails way is so 2005. But I also mean that in a good way. Uh, this is a meta, a meta slide, a slide of Nick taking a slide of me, something like that, yeah. Um, Rails, that Rails is 2005 meant that Rails is cutting edge. It was fantastic. It was an amazing thing in 2005. Um, and that Rails came bundled with things like Prototype, with Scriptaculous, with JavaScript frameworks. With cutting edge JavaScript frameworks was pretty revolutionary. So I'm not trying to troll. Uh, I think it was, it was cutting edge then, and now it's grown up. Just as a recap, what, the way Rails uh, the Rails way for doing views uh, for the view layer back in 2005 was server-generated HTML, so ERB. Prototype, Scriptaculous, were the bundled JavaScript libraries, uh, RJS. I don't know how many people here used RJS. Yay. Uh, RJS is pretty <laughs> cool, actually. Um, it was nicely uh, illustrated here by Amy Hoy. Um, it was really a way to write, to avoid writing JavaScript. And JavaScript was, uh, if you think it's horrible now, it was pretty horrible back uh, 10 years ago. And it provided some nice abstractions so you could keep pretty much, didn't have to have this problem of, of split brain, of having to think in terms of writing extra code in another language. Uh, you could write all of your components in all of your code in Ruby, uh, including in your views. But the Rails way, uh, in my opinion, well, I'll let you make up your minds. This is what it is now. Server-generated HTML, again, you have a few more choices now. You have Slim, you have Haml, but ostensibly the same. You have jQuery instead of prototype in, in Scriptaculous, jQuery UI maybe. But fundamentally, the, um, what is proposed from DHH or the core team is uh, server-generated JavaScript responses. So compare that with RGS. Uh, RGS was uh, <clears throat> never terribly popular, but spot the difference. It, it's, not fundamentally, it's not fundamentally different. Meanwhile, uh, through all of this, someone took this thing called V8 as part of Chrome, and they did something with it. And you can't have missed it, but JavaScript has become huge, and we shouldn't deny that. 
Just look at the number of conferences that they have. Uh, I don't know if the, I'm, I suspect that the number of conferences has eclipsed the, eclipsed the number of Ruby conferences, but I'm not sure about that. What I do know, and this is old data, is that the percentage of JavaScript developer jobs has doubled from 2005 to 2010. So in five years, a uh, big increase there. Um, but even more important, uh, and in prospectively worrying to, to Rails, uh, if you care about market share, has been that the server-side usage of JS has multiplied by six from January 2012 to October 2014. There is um, quite a bit of innovation going on, though, in the JavaScript world. One thing that I'd like to um, just touch upon uh, is this movement called the No Backend Movement. And they are proponents of something called offline-first development, um, which is something of a, the term No Backend itself is something of a misnomer, because it's not necessarily getting rid of a backend. It's having a backend there but being able to work without the backend uh, if it's not available. Um, and what they do, uh, these frameworks that have signed up to the no backend manifesto, is they try to provide useful standardized abstractions and APIs for backends. So standard backend tasks will be things like authentication, data persistence, sync. A few examples. Uh, Another Berlin reference here, another Berlin team working on this, Hoodie, which is offline by default. Uh, it takes a document approach. It's backed by CouchDB. In fact, um, some of the CouchDB committers are working on this. That's something that's definitely worth taking a look at. Uh, probably more popular, though, or more well-known is Meteor, also offline first. And in fact, these frameworks, uh, one of the compelling one of the things that one of their selling points is sharing code between the server and the client side. So I, and there is a fancy name for this, which is isomorphism. But um, it's just a fancy word, which means you can share, you can share code on uh, the front and the back, back end. Besides this, um, there are some even more well-known uh, front end frameworks, which I will just iterate through very, very quickly, I'm sure. Most people in the, this room are now familiar with what they, with what they, um, with what is out there in the market. But some things you might have seen, um, grouped as MVC or MV uh, star, uh, MV asterisk frameworks, because they are not necessarily pure implementations of MVC, rather than model view view model, uh, Silverlight style um, frameworks are uh, Angular JS. Then you have Knockout and Ember, uh, pretty well known. And of these uh, three frameworks here, I will touch much more on Angular and Ember because I know those frameworks pretty well and done quite a bit of work with them. Uh, but there's also the rise of the component-based framework and frameworks that support one-way binding, um, React, Reactive, Backbone, XJS. Also, I could have added there Polymer, which is um, which is uh, implementation of web components. Since there isn't a lot of time, I would urge you to check out To Do MVC if you need to pick a framework, want to explore all of the ways that you can uh, build front-end uh, MVC-like or um, single-page applications. Ever, all of this is really, really nice, but I don't want to live in a JavaScript-only world. Um, I'm a proponent of polyglottism, both in the real world, when it comes to spoken language, and when programming. So let's go back to the question that we asked earlier. Is there room for Rails in any of this? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to get rid of this mindset that it's DHH's responsibility to tell us how to do things. Uh, this is a great quote from a conference Rosloff in uh, last year in Poland. Um, I think we need to get over the Rails way and instead embrace the flexibility of Rails. Um, there was so much work done with the MERB merge back uh, four, five years ago already, 
Um, and Rails affords us a huge amount of flexibility. So we should embrace that and not be consigned to using any specific methodology. But before you even worry about all of this and where Rails fits in with single page applications, do you even need a single page application at all? Well, naturally that's content dependent. Um, think about what your content is. If you are doing something along the lines of information pages where most data is public, if you are building a Wikipedia, I would say you don't, even, you don't want a single page application. It just is not the right fit. Uh, where you have a membership site where some data is personalized, and a good example of this might be Airbnb or it might be a travel, a travel site, uh, a flight booking site, where you have some generic information and some information that is only specific to a user. Um, then maybe, maybe, SP, an, <coughs> maybe a single page application would be a good fit. Finally, if you have a closed system, if you have something like an intranet or a dashboard, or you have a document-based system, if you have a Google Docs, where nearly all the information is specific to the user, specific to the user at a particular point in time, to their session, um, then a, a single-page application is a very, very good fit. So a few of the issues you have to think about when considering whether you want a single-page application, authentication, how real is real time, um, how important is it that you have actual information on your screen? Um, thinking about a stock system, it's uh, seconds cost money, but if it's a uh, wiki, you, it might not matter if you have information that's a minute or two stale. Uh, that, of course, then can, uh, leads on to the issue of caching and indexing, uh, SEO. So all of these things combine to all of these things combined uh, really come under the umbrella of how unique is the view that you want. Uh, as mentioned earlier, a blog with comments is something that you can afford a large, that you can probably cache quite heavily. It won't matter if the comments are not in real time for the most part unless you have a specific need uh, for real time comments, but for the most part most use cases is probably not necessary. Uh, hotel page with reviews, it might be important depending on your, um, your business case to have reviews show up instantaneously. And I know that's something that's, um, that's happening more and more frequently. If you go to airline sites, you can now see that when tickets are being booked uh, as a way to incentivize you to book rapidly. But it's probably not necessary um, from a technical point of view. And then finally, dashboard. Well, there you want data is unique to a particular point of time, to a particular user. Uh, so going back to the Wikipedia model, where you have curated content, where it's, you have generic content, I would contend that the Rails way is still a good fit. But I would contend also that the Rails way is really only optimized for this curated content route. Things like Russian doll caching are actually extraordinarily complicated to deal with when you have something like a dashboard. If you, um, if you have a single page application, then you need to move away from the Rails way. And I will, in the next section, I will give you some tips uh, on how you can move away from the Rails way and keep Rails in your stack. So, um, this is mostly a pra uh, practical section. First of all, if you come to pick a framework, um, one of the questions you might ask yourselves is, what framework is most like Rails? Uh, you consider yourself a Rails developer. What framework there is easiest to get up and running with? Well, there's a very simple answer to that, and that is MJS because it was created by Yehuda. Um, actually, that's just me being flippant. The real reason for that is that there are technical similarities. 
one of which is the way that uh, fundamentally Angular and um, Ember update information on the page. Uh, Angular uses something called dirty checking, at least in Angular 1, uh, whereas Ember requires you to uh, inherit all of your objects from Ember object in order to get the benefits of uh, updating the view and the benefits of bindings. The second thing I would say that makes Ember more similar to Angular is the routing DSL. Um, in Rails, you have built-in routing. Rail, the router in Rails is a very, very fundamental part of what Rails does. You can't, I don't believe you can actually take the router out of Rails and use Rails and invoke controllers. There's, I don't believe there's a way to, to invoke controller actions without the Rails router, that, 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 that there's a way to, to um, replace that. Um, Ember has uh, built-in routing. You can't do much in Ember without their built-in routing. Angular does not have, uh, has a very rudimentary in Angular 1.3, very rudimentary router. Until Angular 1.4 comes out, nested routing, for example, is something that you just can't do without a third-party option like Angular UI router. But I think <laughs> the thing that makes Angular uh, less like Rails and something we underestimate as programmers is vocabulary. In the world of Rails, you have models, controllers, views, initializers. In Ember, you have models, controllers, views, initializers. In Angular, you have Java 2 EE. You have dependency injections, factories, service providers, transclusion, transclusion, what is that? You have all of these terms that, take, that add a little bit to your learning curve. Uh, and won't be so familiar to you. So a few tips uh, coming to the end of this presentation. If you keep Rails in your stack but want to err from the Rails way but, and want to keep the assets pipeline, one thing you can do already is use Bower. And you can use sprockets with Bower right now. In fact, there are three options for this. One of which is to install a gem called Bower Rails, which gives you a Ruby gem file like DSL on top of Bower and handy rake tasks for managing Dart JavaScript, depend JavaScript, developer, yeah, JavaScript dependencies. But in my opinion, that's not necessary. I don't see why I should need to write Ruby and use a Ruby DSL when I can write JSON. I think every good Ruby developer knows how to write JSON. The second thing you can do is you can just con uh, amend your Sprockets uh, configuration, provided you're on Rails 4, and uh, set up your load path, and you then you can follow with, through with a JavaScript-based workflow. One other thing you can do is look at railsassets.org, which provides a frictionless proxy um, and lets you specify uh, Bower dependencies in your gem file. I think this is a really clever, innovative uh, solution. My only worry about this is that I'm not sure about whether Rails assets will be around uh, in two or three years, and when you're trying to bundle install a few years down the road, then that could lead to some complications. That's something definitely to look at. Something else to look at is if you're doing Ember, um, it, this is now deprecated, but the idea is, uh, is pretty cool, uh, is a way of layering your Ember application, uh, oh, the JavaScript structure of your Ember application over the Rails structure. So it's similar to what some of the JavaScript frameworks are doing, mixing front-end and back-end code. Um, the difference here, of course, though, is because you have some code in Ruby and some in JavaScript, there isn't that much sharing. Finally, what is the way forward when doing uh, front-end development? Well. One thing you could look at is Vault. I don't know if anyone's heard of Vault. Cool idea, based on Opal RB. It um, uses Ruby everywhere, which is really cool. Uh, you write your uh, you write your views um, in a handles bar with a handles bar like syntax, and then you write controllers uh, in Ruby, and that will compile to JavaScript. That's pretty cool. Um, but my problem there is I don't really like monoliths, and 
I think that might well work well for a small application, but I don't think it will scale well. In fact, if you look at Vault, it's not that much different than, than RGS, really, uh, from what we were doing 10 years ago. So I think, in my opinion, the way forward is to split your application, is to build two applications, at least two applications, is to have an API application and to have your front end. And this is additional overhead at the beginning, but affords you a great deal of flexibility. You have a full choice of API clients. You can stick with Rails. And Rails, of course, provides a very, very fine, um, fine, it's a very fine framework for developing an API. But you have all of these other Ruby choices or all of these other languages that you could deal with. And then you have your front end choices. And I discussed this actually with Steve Klabnik, and I think the architectural decoupling is good for us, and the client-server model actually works, and we should stick to that. Um, I also think monolingualism is bad, so I don't see any reason to write your whole stack unless you're dealing with a very trivial application in one specific language. The other really big advantage, though, is JavaScript tooling. JavaScript tools for front-end, I hate to say it, are good, they're compelling. Um, Grunt is, is horrible, but uh, I think Gulp is, is pretty cool, and there is, there is such a, a wide number of framework, such a not wide number of libraries available for doing everything from building, uh, building SVGs to making uh, SVG sprites to PNG sprites for, um, uh, you name it, uh, there's a huge, huge ecosystem out there, and I think you should take advantage of of that. There are also alternative build pipelines, and I've had so much frustration with sprockets, I would really recommend looking at something like Browserify or Webpack. Uh, Webpack, again, affords a huge amount of flexibility. You can use uh, the next generation of JavaScript, ES6, right now. Uh, you can uh, build in compression. You, can, you have a whole uh, range of options for bundling your assets. Um, but the thing that really got me sold on building, on moving to a JavaScript build chain on the front end was testability. And I want to keep Capybara. I love Capybara. I want to keep it around for smoke tests. But I do not want to load a Rails application in order to run JavaScript unit tests. That makes no sense to me at all. So that was the reason I was sold on that. And right now, we're developing very, very fast. And we have test suites that run in seconds. Uh, with Karma. Lastly, isomorphism is possible with this in this scenario, and Airbnb have a very good article. I'm running out of time, but um, I would recommend you take a look at it. Um, isomorphism is still something that you can do as an optimization, uh, as an optimi as part of an optimization stage, where you may want to um, heavily used views, you may want to pre-render them in the browser. There is a project out there right now that the Ember developers, the guys from Tilda, are working on called Ember Fastboot that will server render some of your Ember views um, so that Ember starts up much, much faster and you don't have to load a whole bunch of JavaScript code just to get something on the page. So I think this is the future. Will the SPA, will the single page application kill Rails? Conclusion, in my opinion, I don't think it will kill Rails. I think it will kill the Rails way. I think the Rails way, the way of you, uh, is, is dead. But I think Rails has a bright future if it adopts these technologies. Um, that is it. Muito obrigado. Perguntas? I don't think I have time. Uh, why do you think Grunt is terrible, and what do you suggest in instead? Uh, so I didn't get the question. Why do you think Grunt is terrible, and what do you suggest instead? Um, I gulp. There are a couple different uh, build tools there um, that are popular: gulp, Grunt, and Broccoli. I just don't like the syntax of um, of Grunt. I I don't know why, but. Um, 
Gulp seems to work better for me, and I like the fact that it uses streams. I think that works, makes a lot of sense to me. It's slightly more, um, it's slightly less declarative, but uh, for some reason it just kind of clicked with me better. All right, thanks. Okay.